Hello, this is Bangkok Chit Chat, the YouTube channel from Thailand, all about Thailand. And today we're going to be discussing COVID-19 with regard to the situation and the capacity to cope with the pandemic here in Thailand, and also understand the vaccines presently available and to become available. Uh, our guest today is Dr. Eric Fleischmann, Executive Medical Director of Bangkok uh, Anti-Aging Center. He is a licensed American physician and surgeon with over 25 years in over 25 countries and has practiced in the clinical fields of oncology, infectious diseases, anti-aging, public health, general practice, and also emergency medicine. Uh, he was involved in the primary development of care and treatment for some of the world's greatest medical challenges, such as HIV, AIDS, Ebola, Hepatitis C, tuberculosis, dengue fever, and malaria. Dr. Fleischmann has received a Lifetime Humanitarian Award for his HIV, AIDS, and refugee work in eight African countries from the International First Ladies of Africa Summit in Los Angeles, California, in 2013. Dr. Eric has extensive experience in medical business development and management, working with some of the top medical providers in the world, including International SOS, Bumung Rad International Hospital, the William J. Clinton Foundation, and other Fortune 500 businesses globally, with the business development work extensively in Southeast Asia and also the Middle East. Well, what an introduction. Welcome and thanks for joining us, Dr. Eric. Hey, hey, Andrew and Andrew. Thanks for this asking. This is when you say here. none of that. That's it. You got the wrong bio here. <laughs> yeah. I could have given you the three lined one, but I just let you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote it. Yeah. Okay, well. <laughs> Uh, before we go, before we go into specifics about vaccines, let's discuss some of the general queries people have asked us to ask you. And the first question being, how accurate are the new case figures here in Thailand? I don't, um, I don't believe that they're very accurate at all for a couple of reasons. Um, you, you know, when you talk about case accuracy, you have to talk about case testing, right? And we know that early on in Thailand, there was actually I don't know, there, there was what I would call a hesitance towards doing a lot of testing, which I agree with uh, in a number of ways I'll tell you about later. Um, what happens is once cases start to ramp up, so does testing. And anytime you test more people, you get more cases. And then when you have those positive cases, then you have to realize how you're going to put them in statistically. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like if you get a thousand new cases, all of a sudden somebody thinks that's a thousand new deaths. And it spreads an unwarranted fear, right? When it could be, um, you know, 965 asymptomatic infections. And then, you know, a few people went to the hospital because they were mandated to. So I, I don't think the numbers are very accurate. Like I said, the numbers are as accurate as the testing at any given time. <clears throat> well, so what percentage do you think would be is wrong? You think it's two times this, three times this, 10 times this, or you just don't want to protect? <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I've got no crystal ball for this one, really. Um, you also have to understand that a lot of the testing now is being done in clusters. For example, um, when the infection was alleged to have started in the Myanmar uh, migrant workers camp during the last wave, the smaller wave, um, those were massive clusters. And if you look at Singapore, remember Singapore <clears throat> at one time had thousands and thousands of cases, and they were all from the migrant barracks where everything is being contained and spreading within itself, whereas in the rest of Singapore, there were only 25 cases. Um, and this is why when you just put cases out there, it, it creates um, not a really accurate representation of what might be going on. So it's so more I, than I you think no it is just now, yeah? It's more than, the, than what's being said just now. That's your, your thoughts, yeah? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think that COVID ever left Thailand, to tell you the truth. I think, um, you know, I think it's just been kind of slow burning. It's, it's literally impossible to clear an entire country uh, of, an, <clears throat> of an infection. Um, there's always going to be subclinical infections that people are getting. And then, you know, all of a sudden it hits a, it, it's like lighting a match and putting it in the wind. And then all of a sudden it hits some uh, tinder somewhere else. And all of a sudden you have a fire. Okay. On, on, the, on, the, on the present uh, figures of around about 2,000, 2,500 a day yeah, on the general public, 
as, as opposed to the prisons, yeah? not that they're unimportant, but uh, in the general public. Uh, do you think <coughs> hospitals uh, and the field hospitals can cope with this growth per day? Well, that's a very good question. Let's talk about what the hospitals are being used for. Um, now, I do, I do um, consultation on COVID infections all over the world every week through uh, Teladoc. I'm one of their consulting doctors. So we get calls from India, a lot of calls from India, as you could imagine. Calls from the States, calls from Spain, calls from Europe, calls from Egypt. <clears throat> and it, it all depends on how the government is managing these things. Okay, there's other countries that have less medical capacity than Thailand does, yet they're managing it different. For example, in uh, Egypt, if somebody has COVID, the government tells them, talk to your doctor, they screen them. Do you have symptoms? Are you short of breath? Do you have a fever? Do you have things that need to go to the hospital? And of course, in the grand majority of the cases, um, they don't, so the people are mandated, stay home for 14 days, isolate, and they self-quarantine. Thailand uh, has a different approach to it, where if you're positive, they quarantine you in a group of a lot of other people, and that place that they're quarantining people is in the hospitals. So there's a lot of people in the hospitals that don't need to be in the hospitals. Yeah. From what I understand, um, and, and I would need to be corrected on this, I don't believe that the ICUs are filling up. The death rate in Thailand is about the same as the death rate um, all over the world. It's under uh, 0.4%. Um, so I, I don't think we have a very accurate view of things. <clears throat> and like I said, most other countries and the ones that I work with, they don't tell people to go to the hospital when they have COVID. They screen them, triage them, and tell them to stay home with their family and isolate for 14 days. And I think that's a very reasonable thing to do so that you don't burn out your hospital capacity. But is, is it the government basically saying that, uh, as we were discussing before, number one is uh, if they're with the family, should the whole family be uh, uh, isolated? Because if one person's got it, the likelihood is you're going to pass to the rest of the family. So just because that one person has it, should the whole family isolate? And also, is it because the, the government do not trust the average person to discipline themselves to stick by it? Well, I don't think any government trusts the average person. <laughs> you talk about that. <clears throat> but, I don't um, trust myself. <laughs> yeah. But, but you no, know, it's a very good point. And like I said, this is what most governments are doing just so they don't run out of their capacity is they're doing proper triage. You know, it's mm -hmm. the same thing in medicine. Like I give patients instructions what to do. And, you know, I hope they're following my advice most of the time. Yeah. <clears throat> but again, when it comes to a matter of isolating a deadly infection, for instance, right, here, here's, a, here's a good contrast to it. So I, I worked in West Africa during the Ebola epidemic. Okay, I was in Liberia and I was working in four different Ebola camps and running them. Now, Ebola, as we know, is a highly deadly disease and it had a mortality rate of over 50%, depending on which country you were in and what was available. So there, uh, the same thing, the spread was um, as bad or worse than uh, COVID-19. So then if we had a family that, is, that was exposed, absolutely, they were all taken and put into quarantine. And that wasn't a home quarantine because if these people did travel in their village or go anywhere, then it meant a lot of other people were going to die because this was a horrible, horrible, most deadly disease I've ever seen in my life. Um, if you contrast that with COVID-19 or even with the flu, when we find out that a family has the flu, we don't isolate them, right? We tell them, you know, stay home if you have the flu, don't do these things. But all of a sudden, you see COVID's kind of being treated like Ebola with people. Like get them out of the house, put them into quarantine. Um, in my experience in other countries, you can trust people to quarantine themselves. And then you have to look at the risks and the benefits of doing so. So the risk of doing so is that people are going to, you know, get cheeky about it and say, well, you know, I feel fine. I'm not going to spread it to anybody. And they might break the rules a little bit and spread the disease. The benefits are that you're not putting people in a hospital who don't need to be in the hospital because hospitals should be your last line of defense with the ICU being DEFCON 5. Yeah. You know? Is that where the field hospitals and these uh, hotel, what are they called? Uh, Hospital. Hospitals. Hospitals. Yeah. 
they are more for the people that are not in serious condition but have tested positive. So they could be asymptomatic or whatever, yeah? So my right. other um, a big, big question here is, are the public avoiding being tested because they don't want to be marshaled off to one of these field hospitals where, you know, they're not allowed to see relatives. They're obviously their lifestyle has completely changed around for 14 days. So do you, do you think the right. Thai way is I'm going to stay at home and for as long as I have to stay at home, I may have it, I may not have it, but I'll pretend I have got it. So I'll always wear the mask. I'll be careful in my habits. And when I go out and wash my hands and that, do you think a lot of that's going on? It, 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 that depends on the level of fear that people have from COVID and the level of information coming out about it. Now, in this, in this country, there's a tremendous level of fear, even in people who you know, would not be potential victims of uh, COVID-19 death, which is most people. So just to review those rules, if you're under 70, if you're healthy, if you don't have diabetes, obesity, some kind of chronic disease, asthma, COPD, you know, you know, any kind of chronic thing, you have a 99, 99.6% chance of surviving COVID. You'll get a bad man flu. You'll be miserable for a few days, but you're going to survive, right? I think a great number of Thai people feel that each and every one of them, even if they're 25 years old, is going to die from COVID. They're in a the problem. So what happens if, if these people test positive, they will go to the quarantine because they're afraid they're going to die. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then there's the other group, which I would imagine would be more in the expat community that says, you know what? I got some education on this. I got the sniffles. I don't really feel that bad. And I don't want to sit in a room with 200 other people for 14 days. Um, I think that group is going to stay home. And this is why, uh, going back to your first question, this is why we're not getting accurate numbers. And it's a, it's a best guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So basically it's the fear of that tiny percentage is what's making people go and get tested. I, I think so. Yeah. I mean, cause I, I would say in, in the type people that I speak to, <clears throat> the ones coming into my clinic, cause our clinic is still open. We're still seeing people. Um, I would say about 75 to 80% of the people that I talk to, and this is of all ages, including young people and healthy people, have a tremendous fear of getting COVID, even college students that I talk to. If I get COVID, oh my God, what's gonna happen? And, but see, on the other hand of it, I talk to COVID patients every week. You know, I talk to 10, 20, 30 COVID patients a week. So I see the smattering of symptoms. And I can tell you, in my estimation, um, in my experience of doing this now for nine, 10 months, every week talking to people, <clears throat> the grand majority of the infections are flu like illness, you know, where people, you know, in fact, I have a lot of people calling me and they say, do I have COVID? You know, and we ask certain questions. Have you lost your sense of smell? Have you lost your sense of taste? Um, the amount of people that we talk to that we have to send to a higher level of care is an incredibly, incredibly small percentage. So, but I have that education, so I'm not that worried about it. And you know, the people I know, and in my clinic, what we do is we, we, we bolster people's immunity so that they don't have to worry so much about it. So if they get an infection, it's either going to be asymptomatic or, um, you know, they'll have the sniffles and won't have to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. But I do understand the fear of people going through social media and seeing, you know, if they see one COVID death, they identify with that as opposed to the 99.6% yeah. yeah, of people. Yeah, they can't see the ratios. They just look at the worst exactly. possible. Yeah. Okay. So exactly, so and this this is where the this is where the education process on COVID becomes very very important. So, with regards to things like masks, I mean, the US now have said that the, there's less importance of wearing masks, and, and now it's becoming probably uh, you know it, the individual is making that decision in the US, but here it's it's uh, mandated you have to wear a mask outside your own home. Yeah. How much difference does this mask actually make? <laughs> it's, it's a hard question. Now, I'm a believer in, in wearing the mask in appropriate situations. And quite honestly, I, I can't really understand the ire from my, uh, I'm American, of course, and I can't understand the, um, 
you know, the planting of feet in the sand that the people in America are getting, I'm not wearing a mask, no, but you know, you're not taking my Agreed, personal yeah, yeah. rights. Agreed. I'm Agreed. like, oh my God, is this really, do you have this much time during your day where this is your battle in life? Present time, you know yes. I mean? Put the mask no on. <laughs> They're all put the mask up. on. You know, put the mask on, shut up, go about your day. Um, I think masks are very helpful. I think we've just lost Eric for a moment there. Uh, we'll try and get him back to stay with us. So it's interesting anyway, oh, so far, I gained much more knowledge just for speaking to somebody that knows what they're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. You know, transfer of information, Yeah, which right. is what he's just said. The information is not maybe coming over. So that's why people are frightened. If they knew what he knew, people may be a bit more carefree. Yeah, but great. if people were more carefree, maybe the spread would be worse. So maybe the fear factor is not necessarily quelled by governments because they want to have that fear factor. Well, also, I think it's also the government with the, the confidence in the people uh, yeah. as, as well. But there's, there's going to be abusers in uh, every society. Yeah. yeah? So well, I'm getting in my ear. We're, we've uh, lost the connection. Are, okay. we, are we back there, Eric? Back? Oh, of right, course. So, yeah. so what, what we'll do is we'll start. You know, if I was a conspiracy theorist, I think somebody might have stepped in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the last question. So, so what about the, the, the effect, the effectiveness of using uh, a mask? Yep. I'm sorry, say that one more time, please. The effectiveness of using a mask, what's the effect? Is, is there benefit from it uh, or not? Or is this just one big uh, controlling factor to focus people on the oh, yeah, yeah. situation? Um, mask protect other people from you. Okay, masks don't really protect you, except that you're not touching things and putting them around your mouth so much. And we know that COVID is more of an airborne than a surface. You know, the, the surface theory has been pretty much driven down that this is not a surface driven type of infection. Really? Because I actually, I actually yeah. was always warned uh, that, you know, watch the surfaces, avoid, don't touch the, on the escalator, don't touch things. And so it's not a matter of just touching. Oh, yeah, I mean, that. that that's a good policy, but the studies that they did on it showed that it actually does not exist on surfaces for as long as, you know, unless you put it in ideal um, clinical conditions, which, you know, I don't see at MBK, um, it, it, it doesn't exist on uh, surfaces for that long. So it's airborne. So well, the mask, does, mask, the mask so? does protect other people from you and it's good for that regard. And I support it. And I think it's, you know, I think it's a good thing in general to do if you're, if you're potentially sick. Right. Okay. Question here. In the beginning of the outbreaks, when, you know, I don't know how much more we've learned from the very beginning, to be honest. And I feel sorry for people in power that have to make these decisions and then change them 24 hours later. And, oh, they're changing their mind now, but it's forever going on. But there was one variant. There was one. That's, now you've got the UK yeah. variant, the Indian. Is there a difference? And what is the difference between these different? Well, the variants? difference in the variants. Um, it is, hasn't, ha, doesn't have to do with any of the lethality because the death rate throughout all these variants has not really increased. And there's a couple of factors having to do with that. But you have to understand what a virus likes to do is to live. So what a virus likes to do is to live and spread and replicate. That's the job of a virus. If a virus kills its host, then it can't do that. That's counterproductive to its survival, right? So what these mutations have done has improve the spread of the disease and the transmissibility without increasing the death toll or the lethality of the virus, okay? They're clever, aren't they? Um, in most cases, although they're still getting data, the vaccines still work on these variants, on most of them. Um, but, you know, as time goes on, just like with the flu, they will have to develop vaccines that are more specific for each mutation, depending on what the dominant mutations are. Okay. But, you know, does this mutation mean we're going through the zombie apocalypse? No, I don't think so, because this is not a lethal virus like Ebola. And this is why Ebola didn't keep spreading, because it killed its host too quickly. Right. So Ebola was not a perfect virus. Yeah. All right. I think we can move on now. That was well, a good I think segue. We just have the, thing, what, the, the one question about the herd immunity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, people are talking about herd immunity, 70%. Uh, of uh, you have to get for the vaccines to be covered. How does that work? And what is what is the aim of uh, herd immunity? Is it that basically people won't get it, or uh, there's people have built up an immune system to it, or how, how does that work? 
Herd immunity means when you get enough people in the population who develop antibodies, you know, the antibody production is what kills the virus in the body. Your body makes antibodies, virus enter your bodies, antibodies kill it, which means you either get no infection or a subclinical infection where you don't know you're sick or you get a very late infection, right? And that has to do with the degree of antibody production that each vaccine does, which I believe we're going to talk about. Um, herd immunity is when you have enough people with antibodies that the, the disease is going to burn out. It, it's not going to have a chance to spread, right? This virus is not going to live forever. If, if, if you have COVID, um, Andrew, and you cough it out into the world, it doesn't just sit there forever waiting for a host. If it doesn't find a host, it dies, you know, from sunlight and oxygen and everything that is not an appropriate environment for it. Herd immunity says where you don't have enough people for it to spread to, so it dies off. Okay, I've got one quick, quick thing. Yeah, is uh, we were just I was asking before for people at home. You said that the surf surface issue is not really an issue, but uh, you know the the recommendation for uh, restaurants, for homes, etc., is clean with alcohol and do all this. But is it just right. going to die within a matter of hours or days or at what yeah. point? Well, if you're if you're cleaning it with if if you're in a hot place. Um, and COVID gets on the table, it's not going to be alive probably for more than a few minutes, to tell you the truth. Right. Um, okay. really uh, that's that was very important. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. right. You, no, you, I'm not I'm saying, proud. listen, I'm, 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 a, I'm a clean freak, believe me. I wash my hands like, you know, <laughs> in medicine, I wash my hands like 20, 30 times a day sometimes. That's the appropriate thing to do. You should keep clean. You should clean your surfaces. When you clean your surfaces, you get rid of all kinds of other bacteria and funguses and viruses and things you don't want in your body anyway. Um, and there are certain circumstances where, you know, somebody coughs on the table, you sit there, you put your arm in it, um, then of course it could spread. But the point I was making was at first, um, you were talking about the recommendations for everybody. And at first it was, it's on a surface, you're going to get it. It's in the air, you're going to get it. It's in the subway, you're going to get it. And there has been lessening of this amount of fear of each way of transmission now that the science has come out further. And believe me, if this was surface spread, each and every one of us in Bangkok would have it already. Well, I do have one. I know I'm the one trying to move this on. I've got one question for you. And there's a basic, so how is it transmitted? How could I possibly, I mean, unless I touch a surface that had something on there, some phlegm or some whatever it is, two minutes, is that how people are catching it then? Or are they catching it from the air where then the masks do come in, in handy? Uh, they're, they're, catching it, they're catching it from the air. Okay, okay. And that's where the masks do come in. Okay. That's the, the grand majority of way. And, that's social... and people living in, and people yeah. living in close, uh, close quarters who are having right. not just one single exposure to it, but multiple like prison exposures to it during the day. Okay. Let's go on to vaccinations, if that's okay with you, Eric. Okay. okay, so I'll just do the uh, just introduce it. So uh, it was announced that foreigners would be able to get vaccinations uh, free before August now, uh, and then it's after August. So we're not really clear wh wh when the foreigner will be able to get it from the government. So uh, the the vaccines that would be available would be the AstraZeneca from the UK and Sinovac Biotech from China. Uh, so people were going to have to register. They're building a new app uh, for, for the foreigner, which is going to be in English, uh, and they'll be able to register in August. But it's going back and forward all the time. So the, the, there's approved viruses, uh, viruses, vaccinations, <laughs> yeah. uh, which are Pfizer, big. Johnson Johnson, uh, uh, Sputnik. Moderna, Sputnik, Moderna. AstraZeneca. Sp yeah, yeah. Sputnik, so, yeah. But, the, the, but the, the other ones uh, outside AstraZeneca and uh, Sinovac, will be sold uh, through hospitals, and it's gonna be around between 3,000 and 3,500 baht for both of the, uh, the injections. But there's another one that's coming ahead, which is going through tests, I think in the US, yeah, which is Novavax. Uh, and it's still under trials at the moment. And it seems to be getting a lot of uh, uh, press because, it's a, because of its delivery system. So, first question, just now people are very confused and scared as to what vaccination is safest and effective for them. And we discussed this before about people having uh, uh, underlying conditions. Uh, so things, you mentioned things like diabetes, is that diabetes type one, type two, maybe it's heart condition. What kind of things should they be concerned of? Because they're worried about this big 
uh, sort of media frenzy about blood clotting, clotting. What's your advice to people on this? Which, which one should they take? Difficult question. Well, I what's understand. The and what's the difference? And what's the difference? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I'm going to simplify. And actually, if, uh, if you go to our Bangkok Anti-Aging International Facebook page, I actually did a, um, I, I did a video on this to try to simplify it for people because it is very frightening. So basically, from the information that we have now, which, as you know, changes um, all the time, <clears throat> we do have an idea of which vaccines produce more antibody, effective antibody, and which ones produce less antibody. In order of effectiveness, it's Pfizer first, Moderna, and um, Sputnik is actually right under there too. Um, and these produce the adequate amount of antibodies to about 95% of the cases, okay? If you go down further, um, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and then all the way down on the bottom, Sinovac, which produces about 50% of the amount, okay? So here's the thing with, that I tell people. Um, Taking a virus or taking a vaccine, I'm doing what you're doing now. Taking a vaccine is not like taking an antibiotic that's going to wipe everything out. Okay, totally different way. What this vaccine is doing is presenting, pre presenting you with the defenses to kill a virus once it enters your body effectively to the level that your immune system does it. So for young, healthy people, you know, younger than us, um, if they, they ask me, which, which one should I get? Which one should I get? I say, get any one you can get quickly. Because in younger, healthy people, that small increase in antibody production is probably going to be enough for them. And they, they would have fought it off anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, also understand that people who are asymptomatic are not good spreaders of COVID. You have to be symptomatic to really be able to spread it well. Wow. For people in those upper tiers of age, you know, the people more towards um, in their 60s, I'm, I'm 61, and in their 70s, well, then you want to get a vaccine that has a higher efficiency of production of antibodies, if possible. <clears throat> Once again, that would be the uh, Pfizer, Moderna. AstraZeneca is not bad, but it's not as good as, uh, it's probably good enough, but it's probably not as good as Pfizer and uh, Moderna and uh, Johnson and Johnson. So, you know, to make it very simple, if you're young and healthy, you don't have any diseases, all you have is um, rational or irrational fear of COVID, you know, get any vaccine. If you can get Sinovac, get Sinovac. It'll probably give you enough defenses so you never have to worry about COVID. If you're an older person and you have risk factors, try to get the more effective uh, vaccines. And, you know, hospitals, the private hospitals like Bowman Grad and uh, P of 8 and BNH and Bangkok Hospital, they are ordering Pfizer and Moderna, allegedly, you know, because they're sending things out and a lot of the expats are registering for it. Um, as far as the question of when that's going to happen, I have no inside information mm. on that anymore. Yeah. I didn't think um, you would, actually. But so, I mean... Yeah. So us oldies and uh, your aging clinic must be doing well because you don't look 61 for a kickoff. So you've been taking <laughs> I get high on my own medicine. supply, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so would you say for older people, stay off the Chinese one if possible? But I don't think in Thailand we got a choice. If you're going for the government, you don't get a choice. Well, um, what they're trying to do, at least for uh, Thai citizens, is if you're over 60, you get AstraZeneca. Okay. Which does, ha which does have a higher level of antibody production. And I think it's probably fine. Um, but like I said, for older people, especially if you have diabetes, heart issues, or any kind of chronic disease, then you want to stay on the more effective ones. Mm -hmm. But here's the other part of it. Um, there's so much that you can do to make your own immune system better that you should be doing. That's really, really simple. You should be taking vitamin D every day, 5,000 units. That alone is going to limit the severity of a COVID infection and limit the severity of COVID um, affecting your lungs, which is why people die from COVID, right? It's a, lung, it's a bad lung infection. You take zinc every day, 15 milligrams, that is going to increase your immune capacity and your healing capacity as well. Um, you take vitamin C, uh, 2,000 milligrams a day. Vitamin C, I I've been given vitamin C intravenously since 1992. Okay, I think we've just lost Eric just for a second there, but we'll keep on talking and just go over quickly what he's just been talking about. That was interesting. Asymptomatic, don't spread. 
asymptomatic, sorry, don't oh, spread as less, well. Don't less. spread as well, yeah. Well, because, I mean, I thought they were the dangerous ones because they're mm. going around everything in the world, wonderful, lovely, mm. I haven't got it, and they have, and they're giving it to everyone, but yeah. there's a less chance of them spreading it. Yes, that's so right. So that's, that's nice right. to know. And it's also it's, it's good to know about uh, for your different ages, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also, also with AstraZeneca. Uh, I mean, uh, we'll go on to the delivery methods and things like that, but people are concerned about the blood clotting and... and uh, that kind of thing, which is, which is mm. very, very minor, one in a million, yeah, from yeah. what I hear, yeah. yeah. You can, you can when you mean the delivery methods, do you mean the grab, no, grab I, bike? No, I, don't, I don't mean by injection, <laughs> but how it, how, how it delivers within the, within the system once you get the injection. Yeah, I'm back again now. Okay, right. there we are, don't worry, we've just had our own conversation for the last couple of minutes, don't worry about that. Okay, carry on with the I question. hope it was pleasant. Um, listen, what I heard you said, asymptomatic people do spread, but not effectively and not efficiently. Okay. okay. All right. It's the same thing with HIV. HIV, when you lower the amount of virus in the body, people don't spread HIV sexually. It's the same thing. That's interesting. The, with, with the guys, this is, I keep hearing about this Novovax, and and the, and it's talking about the delivery system because it goes into I think it's nanoparticles or something like that, nano cells, uh, as opposed to attaching to proteins. I, I, I don't know Whoa. the detail, yeah. But uh, this, the people are. This, I'm not sure the uh, the effectiveness of it, but it's been under trials. What is this different delivery method that they talk about? Well, I have, you know, I haven't had enough time reading about Novavax or information with the ads, so I'm, right, okay. I'm going to have to skip that topic. Oh, that's, that's perfectly okay. okay. All right. So yeah. once, shall we go on to, once you're vaccinated, can you still spread it and can you still get the virus? Uh, well, I know the efficiency of the vac vaccination. Can you still spread it? Can you have it? Um, if you're vaccinated, effectively vaccinated, no, like well, you don't spread it. And in fact, excuse me, in fact, in um, California now, they finally even lifted their mask mandate for people who are vaccinated. You know, and if, if America's doing it with, um, you know, the strict paranoia that they have, then, you know, it's got to be well studied by the CDC. So, no, once you've had the vaccine, you will not spread the virus. That, that can, sounds like a silly you, question. <laughs> No, no, not at all, not at all. Um, once you have been vaccinated, um, you will not spread the virus. Can you get it again? The question now is going to be how long you can maintain an antibody response. And that, since this virus is one year old, still needs to be studied. Yeah. yeah. Can right, you see a time when is, you have to take it yearly? You'll have to take yeah. it annually? Yeah, I imagine there's yeah. going to be, I, I imagine it's going to go into the same thing that the flu did, um, where they're going to, tell the at-risk people, um, you know, yearly to get your COVID booster. Okay. But, you know, that's to be seen because it was the same thing with the flu. Um, you know, every year they, to, to make the correct flu shot, what they have to do is to get the six most popular valence of the virus, put them together and make that, you know, so you got the most popular vaccine. It doesn't work everywhere, but it works effectively enough to create herd immunity, which is what we talked about before. Okay. So that the idea is to limit... Yeah. The idea is to limit the amount of hosts who can support the virus. Yeah, so this, this is the thing about the boosting, you know, with, with all, with all, one thing is with all the different uh, vaccines, some people are saying, well, oh, if I wait a little bit longer, the, the science will have improved and it will be better. So some people are, are not taking it and some people don't believe in it or religiously or whatever it is. Yeah, they, they, they may not take it. Uh, and the other, other thing is that uh, people are saying is, well, if you've got all these different types of vaccines, how are they going to have a common booster for everybody? Yeah? Or we have to get a, a booster from a particular company that made it, a Johnson & Johnson booster, a AstraZeneca booster. Sputnik. Or, yeah, Sputnik <laughs> booster. Just like the name uh, of that. Yeah. <laughs> how does that work? Um, you, you know, what it's going to morph into, if you look at history, is they're going to take the, the top, they'll do the research for what are the top uh, mutations and, and variants at any given year, and then they'll try to put it together to make kind of what they do with the flu shot. So you get the coverage for the most popular uh, variants of the virus around. That, that seems to be the only thing that makes sense. Um, Business-wise, that makes more sense for the vaccine companies to do as well so that they don't get limited to only one strain. So you can see this COVID thing, which we've all, you know, like up to our neck in it and fed up with the whole thing. 
sort of the, the paranoia dying off a bit and it will be in the future at some point be treated just like the old flu from the old days where you got your flu jab once a year, which was trying to keep up with the new variants, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. Um, yes and no, because yeah, this, this is a very strange, most coronaviruses, if you look at the other coronaviruses, this is nothing new, right? Because mm -hmm. we had SARS, we had MERS, we had um, H1N1, right? So we have these coronaviruses, and if you look at their history, they all died out within two to three years. Yes, they did. Yes, mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, like, why did they just suddenly die out? You know, it's, it's a very, it's an interesting point when viruses don't have that kind of longevity, because they actually mutate themselves out of existence, mm. right? In order to get one mutation to spread more, that mutation may also affect the longevity and the lifespan of a virus. It, this is the way history works so that we don't all die from the plague, right? This is oh, right. natural yeah, selection. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, every other co coronavirus, like I said, two to three years had its lifespan and boom, it was gone. This one, um, you know, unless it has been an engineered type of virus, which I don't want to get into the conspiracy theories, but they do abound. Um, if somebody was trying to create the perfect weapon, they got really close with this one, right? Yeah. Um, so we have to see if this one dies out as the other coronaviruses did. If not, then yeah, it'll probably go down to the, who's at risk, let's protect them. We'll go to the nursing homes, go to the old people, go to the diabetics, go to the doctors who take care of uh, old people, and we will prioritize it. Okay, okay. we've got a couple of more questions yeah. before we wind it up. Okay, so uh, just now we've got all these uh, vaccines coming in, and every country it goes through their FDA uh, Food and Drug Association to, to, to basically authorize it to be used in the country. If so many countries are using the same uh, vaccine yeah, across the world, like as an example of Astra, AstraZeneca, why do they have to go through the FDA and delay the whole process of being able to distribute that vaccine? Politics, my friend. Politics. <laughs> It's ridiculous. No, it's, I mean, it delays the whole process. Yeah? Yes, yes and no. A couple of reasons. Um, number one, every country has a process for allowing medicines to be given in their country. Now, the Thai FDA, the, the Thai pharmaceutical industry has been, grow, been growing at a whopping 15% every year. Every year. Okay, it's massive. Now, the one thing Thailand did that was very wise is they created an FDA that has an incredibly high standard. The reason they did this is because if they have Thai drugs now, they can distribute to the rest of Southeast Asia with credibility, right? Yeah. So yeah. if you become a hub for drug distribution in your region, there's a lot of money and success in that. And, you know, it's a great thing to have. Um, so I, I did some research on this before. And the Thai FDA has rules that cannot be bypassed for foreign medicines coming into Thailand or for a medicine that comes in that has not been tested. And regardless of if it's emergency, regardless of if you need it tomorrow, it does have to pass these rules in order to be pushed forward. The speed at which they move when these things happen is beyond me. That has to do with the government and the amount of people there. Now, as we also know, there's a financial side to this. And if you can produce a vaccine in your own country, it's certainly gonna make a lot more money for the government or for the private industry then is to import it and pay the tariffs and just distribute it to the people. So I, I think it's somewhere there within a mix of the FDA rules and the attempts to make sure that your country can produce it for itself. Okay, okay. All right, uh, one question is, uh, uh, I've, been, I've been looking at different different uh, non-vaccine uh, sort of solutions and there's been mention of this product called uh, Inver... In in ivermectin. Yeah, ivermectin. Oh, all right, got it all wrong. Ivermectin. Yeah, it's like getting your pronunciation of your name right I'm, as well. I'm going with Eric on this one. Right. <laughs> so, so what, what, what is what is this about? It's supposed to be reducing symptoms and things like that, and it's actually used for animals. Yeah. Uh, well, but it's also Iver, used... ivermectin is a, a anti a worm medicine. So of course, animals use it more than people do, but people in Africa use it uh, extensively. You know, in, Af in Africa, where I worked for quite a while, you know, just worms are endemic and people have to deworm every few months or every month, right? So they use ivermectin. So ivermectin is an anti-helminthic, which means anti-worm medicine. 
And although it has not been studied extensively in this regard, it does um, appear to limit the ability of the virus to replicate, right? And so if you look at the official warnings from it, you see when people start using a drug that is not FDA approved for that drug, um, governments and drug companies get very, very nervous and they put out warnings right away. Um, number one, because they don't want people to die if there's any adverse reactions. And number two, they don't want it to influence the industry at that point for the direction that their medications or vaccines are going. Now, in India, what's very interesting because of the number of cases there and the lack of medical facilities, they actually have these COVID kits that include ivermectin when people are sick. They got vitamin C, they got, um, maybe they got um, hydroxy, uh, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah, that's um, Vitamin C, right? But they are including ivermectin in it because anecdotally, it seems to be working. And um, safety-wise, this drug's been around forever. You know, it's been around for 70, 80 years and people buy it over the counter. And of course, you know, if, if there was an over-the-counter drug that would kill you, they would take it off the shelves, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it has a safety profile in the grand majority of people. And it's over-the-counter. Um, so if it works and it's in an emergency situation, then yeah, you should take it. But you do have to weigh the risks and benefits of not having an official, an official recommendation for it, okay? Now, when we were treating HIV back in the day before we had any antivirals, we had to do the same thing. There were certain drugs that we had to try like thalidomide uh, and, and other things we were using that would hopefully have an effect on the virus, um, you know, and, and be uh, benign enough where they weren't gonna hurt anybody or cause very bad symptoms or diseases. So that's where ivermectin is right now. But there's a lot of belief in it. Um, personally, uh, I think if I was a person at risk, I would probably take it. If I was, I'm, I'm not taking it now because I'm not. I have a very strong immune system, and I'm young and vital, so I'm not that worried about it. But if somebody was in a situation where they were going to be exposed to COVID and it was unavoidable, then yeah, I, I think it probably, I probably would take it. And that's available here, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I saw you even saw it in Lazada. Yeah. Uh, so I think as a as a final final question, with all this going on, yeah, uh, and the way Thailand is approaching things just now, when do you think we can get back to some normality? Whoa. Obviously, obviously, you can't say specifically, but in your in your guess, do you think the way they're going, we could be we could be back to some form of normality in the middle of next year? No. Because I'm hearing yeah. we can't even fly until 2024. Well, Andrew, Andrew, you did hear an introduction that Andy gave that I'm a doctor, not a politician, right? <laughs> was, there any part, was there any part of that introduction that let you think I was in politics? Because... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you've had your brush I, with I, politics, no doubt. So I know I've by brush not, with politics. you're not hanging on your um, word that you know what, when it is, but do you have any, your own personal idea? Do you think... All right, my own personal idea. Let's, let's look at America. America had a fantastic vaccination program for over 360 million people in America. They're now over 50% vaccinated. And if you look at major cities like New York and Los Angeles, everything is open now. People, um, people wear masks, people don't wear masks. And they are once again thriving until something breaks through. If a vaccine doesn't work or if there's a new variant that's not vaccinated, we don't know the future. But predictably at this point, they're doing quite well. The speed at which Thailand can vaccinate um, its people and then create a rule for vaccinated people who come into the country will be equivalent to the speed that this country gets back on its feet. Um, we had all hoped that this would happen. We all hoped that this would happen four months ago when a vaccine was out. But, you know, for whatever reason, the vaccine program did not thrive as we would have like yeah, that's now another side of the story that yeah we're not gonna we're, we won't go that down that way well first of all i know you're a really busy man so we are so grateful that you spend some time with us and our viewers because for me personally forget the viewers i know much more about it and i was never panicky because i never go out <laughs> but not oh. much anyway <laughs> you know i'm one of them i stay at home really but we feel so much more comfortable. So first of all, thank you very much, because uh, I know your time is valuable. You're very busy. Uh, also, they can look on the description below for the website, which is the uh, Bangkok Anti-Aging Clinic. Is that the, the full name of that? Your... Bangkok, Bangkok Anti-Aging Center. 
Center, okay, and uh, viewers can look on the description below. I'll, I'll provide the link. Yeah. yeah, you provide the link. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Sure, how to and do we it. have um, just just to put a plug in, we we have three branches um, in Bangna, Sutisan, and in uh, Siam, the clinic that I am, which is right next to MVK. We are doing a tremendous amount of immune boosting IVs and procedures and supplements every day. Um, and like I said, in my experience doing infectious disease for over 30 years, strong immune system means no infection. Mm. So don't sit around and wait for a virus when there's actually something you can do. To and eat it. well, eat well, diet. No sugar, cut the sugar out of your diet. Sugar is the cause oh, of all God. evil. <laughs> Plenty of salads, fruit. <laughs> I'm just the messenger, man. But uh, if you cut down sugar, um, you will not get the infections because all these things grow on sugar. All right. Well, we'd love to have you back at some other point to talk about all this other non-COVID stuff that is so helpful. If you're willing to come back on at some point, we'd love to have you back, Eric. So you Absolutely. Can... You know, getting to sit and talk to two handsome gentlemen in the morning is, is well, a good part of my day. So, he's going to be paying your center a visit. I don't need it. But... <laughs> Okay, so once again, Cup Cum Cup, thank you very, very much indeed. And we hope to speak to you uh, in the future. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks very much, right, gentlemen. Thank, thanks for calling. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot.